this is coming from sailja so ma'am can you unmute and uh, can you say how you got this number uh, sir but uh, i do not move the four math sticks i have just rearranged the two math sticks here uh, okay uh, so, that yeah. is one for the four math sticks uh, the four the middle math stick i have placed it uh, likewise uh, i mm -hmm. have made it 80116 first mm -hmm. and uh, then i have removed the six math stick uh, here making it 80115 uh, and then i have used that math stick to mm -hmm. for uh, the placed it uh, between the zero and made it 8815 so uh, the three right. three so, rearrangements i have made only so yeah you have moved this one match stick right and then yeah. this one match stick yeah Uh, right, but the challenge is you have to use four four matchsticks. four matchsticks. So this we got by moving two. Uh, right. So now uh, this goes to uh, the next number. So triple nine five. So can you uh, tell me how you got this triple nine five? Sunil, let me. So. Uh... Uh, remove one one match stick from the first uh, number mm -hmm. so uh, you put it in the third one uh third one means uh, uh the four okay so you will be left with this yeah uh, and yeah and you are and removing that, one here also Yeah, remove uh, one You're from the second one. Here? Yeah, yeah, uh, and and uh, put it in the third one. Okay, so this will become like this, no? Yeah, and remove uh, one match stick from the last digit. Okay, and put. Yeah, yeah. so you are moving this match stick. Uh, this match stick goes here. This you are putting here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right so this moves four matchstick and we have this number uh, 995 so so far this is the maximum uh, we have seen so we have got the other answer also but that involved only two matchsticks now can someone beat this can someone beat uh, 9995 uh, okay what if i told you i have found an answer which is bigger than this can you find that answer Ashwin, I think some people joined late. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll just quickly explain the question again. So, uh, we are just doing this uh, quick math puzzle. So, I have arranged match sticks. Uh, to form this number eight zero four six, and the challenge is you need to move four matchsticks to get a bigger number. Uh, you should not add or remove any of the matchsticks. You are only allowed to move, and you have to move four. Uh, so, so uh, what I've written on the left are some of the answers uh, I've got, uh, but I feel that there's a big uh, there's a bigger answer also. So, can someone see what that answer would be? Okay, so now I have a six-digit number from Pragya. So let me just write it for everyone. No, I think I got it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Who's this? Yeah, yeah. I'm Geeta Anjali. Yeah. So Geeta Anjali, what is your answer? That is double nine, double nine. Uh, right. So I have uh. I have a larger number than that. Yeah, can you share your answer in the chat window? So the biggest number I've gotten so far is the six-digit number one nine nine one one five. Yeah, 
yeah i got that too okay so yeah uh pragya can you share how you got the answer yeah so i moved out uh, the lower uh, left stick from eight and uh, kept it on left side okay which uh, which stick uh the a straight uh, out of two left sticks the lower one okay this one you mean take the first letter nine yeah uh and i have kept that one stick uh, to the left of nine okay so this becomes one like this you mean no uh, uh, to the left okay yeah one nine hmm. and then from the zero i move the lower left stick to the middle hmm. with nine okay so you got then this I, nine hmm. yeah and then from four i hmm. moved the middle stick and kept it uh, on the same place on the left side so that makes it one one okay four is converted to one one hmm. and then out of six i took out the left lower stick hmm. used it to complete the first one okay left most uh yeah this one sir yeah so you got this number and yeah the 6 will become 5 right uh yeah i'm just wondering can you make with the same by removing the same sticks itself but can you end up with a bigger number than this probably we can let us try yeah so i'll just give so, one clue uh, can i can i yeah. say yeah go ahead okay. mega the the one on the left most side should be moved to the right most side exactly ah uh, yeah how <laughs> if we got this yeah. one here now you got yeah. a much bigger number yeah 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 true right but you would be moving much more than four matchsticks right no it's the same four matchsticks but instead of placing the one uh, at the left end we are placing it at the right end that's right right great ah uh. uh right but what if i told you i got an even bigger answer mm -hmm. okay so i'll just uh stop here with the clue that my answer is a seven digit number so it trumps this six digit number also uh yeah we will just pause here and uh, we will continue with the session and maybe towards the end we can come back to this activity again right so the only clue that i want to give that uh, is that uh, the answer that i have got with four matchsticks uh, by moving four matchsticks is a seven digit number uh yeah right so i think i'll hand over to brunal now and uh, yeah we'll continue with the session yes thank you ashwin um yeah a question to all of you how did you like the puzzle would everyone enjoy it? it was very evident that everyone was enjoying right um what if this question was given as an exam question what would have given uh, what answer would have given a full mark you repeat what you asked yeah i asked that uh, i i can see everyone enjoyed the puzzle uh, the question i wanted to know that if uh, let's say this question was an exam question uh which answer would you have given as full mark i don't know about the uh, giving answer but i would have uh, tensed because uh, because it is in the exam it is not an activity it is related to marks okay so you wouldn't have given this question at all is what you are saying yeah i would have left the uh, uh okay uh, yeah any other thoughts um maybe yeah. maybe marks to creativity marks to how many different options did you come up with what were the yeah, different approaches did you take yeah that's one possibility that uh, how many num bigger numbers can you come up with yeah, that's one possibility yeah, yeah that's so, how we would have reframed this question actually for exam yeah that's also good idea yeah so uh, uh, this Uh, was a intro to you know introducing everyone to the world of fenman uh, fenman was supporter of not 
following strict rules and coming up with one answer and thinking about as many possibilities as possible and so on. Um, but before we get a deeper dive into Feynman, a question to everyone, how many of you have read anything by Feynman or anything written about Feynman? I have read. Okay, so uh, yeah, maybe I'll say you can everything that he has written. <laughs> Oh, Pallavi says everything that he yeah. says. Okay. Everything meaning uh, some of his technical work, but surely you're joking. Yes. I have also have the Feynman lectures in physics. So, yes. Okay. Uh, others? Yeah, same here. Uh, surely you must be joking that I've read and his uh, physics books and uh, lectures. Okay. Nice. So, I'm sure you all uh, have, like, have tasted the flavor of uh, Feynman, right? So the idea of this one hour, spending one hour uh, here was not to like rever Feynman on like see how amazing he was and let's let's try and create another Feynman, but uh, sort of examining what all he said and uh, putting it into our context and see if it fits or not fits. Uh, can we uh, sort of remember some of these things and remind ourselves that um, can we uh, do small things differently, right? So uh, this is not a very structured meeting. Uh, it's a small group. It would be really nice if people just jump up and, and like start sharing whatever thoughts come to their mind. I have some ideas which I would like to share, but as I can see, there are multiple people who have read uh, about Fenman and from Fenman. So it would be really nice if you can just start sharing uh, whatever comes to your mind. Uh, at any point, right? Okay, so um, let's. I'll start by reading some excerpts, uh, and then maybe we can take a pause, and then um, um, just chat about what it means to us, right? So. Okay, yes. So, uh, uh, Feynman uh, wrote about, uh, you know, he came across a science textbook and uh, the first chapter of the te textbook was something like that. Um, yeah, so, There is a first grade science book, which in the first lesson of the first grade begins in an unfortunate manner to teach science because it starts off on the wrong idea of what science is. There is a picture of dog, a windable toy dog, and a hand comes to the winder and then the dog is able to move. Under the last picture, it says what makes it move. Later on, there's a picture of a real dog and the question what makes it move. Then there's a picture of a motorbike and a question again, what makes it move and so on. I thought at first they were getting ready to tell what science was going to be about physics, biology, chemistry, but that wasn't it. The answer was in the teacher's edition of the book. The answer I was trying to learn is that energy makes it move. Right? Um, could everyone uh, understand that? Or was I audible enough? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yep. Okay. So what are your thoughts on this? So basically there's a science book which starts with, um, you know, there's a toy dog, there are dogs, there's a horse cart, and uh, until uh, below every picture of 
that moving, there's a question saying, what makes it move? The ultimate idea that the book wants to convey is that energy makes it move. This is the uh, first grade textbook and the first chapter. So what are your thoughts? Uh, at least to me, it's not clear what is Feynman's uh, objection to what is written in the textbook. Uh, that seems like a fair answer. So what is his problem with it? Okay, yeah. So we'll hear from others, maybe. Yeah, so me, the issue is that a child uh, is being uh, taught to come to a conclusion without any experience. Okay. And so uh, we are trying to take the child to a place of which he has no inkling. Uh, so uh, the connecting the dots has not happened. So we are not starting from something concrete of which he has an experience and then connecting it to something else and to something else and then uh, making it finally make him uh, make him have this thing that okay there is something beyond this and there is something beyond this and finally he arrives at energy somehow okay uh, so you're saying that uh, there is no experience you just you're just reading and telling this is energy right? yeah and then the, uh, he'll only be left to memorize the answer right yeah, because he cannot grasp that abstract concept. Okay. So you two things. Just the energy. It's only yeah. an abstract concept that we have coined as human beings. Right. So you're talking about two things. One is there's no experience, no concrete experience. Second is it's con that experience itself is connected to something abstract, which is not like visible right away in front of us. Right. right. Yeah, I think these are great things. And secondly. Uh, this would be totally missing out on the joy of learning. Right. That's yeah. Another aspect. The excitement and the joy would be totally missing from it. Right. Yeah. So experience people might still bring in, right? That's what is called hands-on science. So uh, instead of showing a picture of dog, maybe people might be given, I mean, I don't know, toy dogs or asked to walk around and play with their notebooks and so on. So experience might still happen, but uh, will it still bring in the joy to connect it to energy? We are still not sure. So I think these are great points. Uh, what do others think? Um, Hello, I think, I think uh, he, uh, Feynman uh, didn't uh, tell uh, what to think. He indirectly said uh, uh, how to think and also uh, the teacher can uh, uh, make the concept into a concrete thing. It, it, though it, there were pictures, uh, the teacher can give a toy dog and so on and make it an activity. And, uh, and uh, in, instead of putting directly the word into in their mind, it is uh, the children, uh, they themselves come up with the, making the children come up with the answer. But there, is there any way that first grader would come up with the answer of energy by themselves? May not be energy, but uh, something related no, to something. that. It need not be energy. Need not be energy. Okay. For first grader, that vocabulary is too high. Okay. Yeah. So these are from real textbooks. Even ICSE textbooks nowadays, they have these kind of chapters and these kind of concepts. So we are not talking about anything abstract right here. Uh, although this has been written way back, uh, it is still relevant today. So uh, it is mostly uh, talking about a real life experience and also experiential learning, I would say, and also and working on a previous knowledge okay. instead of directly going into uh, jumping into the topic. Okay, sure. So any other thoughts from anyone before I can? Yeah. Uh, any more thoughts? I think uh, some. I think Megha was saying. Something. No, yeah, I know. I think I pretty much agree with what uh, the f first one was saying. Say, uh, uh, I I would I would I mean uh, bringing concept from near to far. So of course the dog, the toy, and all these are very nearby concepts. But rather than doing something practical, uh, the teacher was expecting a textbook answer mm -hmm. rather than you know expecting an answer in the children's own words upon how they perceive right. these things are moving. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, as I said, if we ask... And, and a first, for a first grader, anything should be okay. I mean, whatever the child has perceived hmm. from his perspective, hmm. his or her perspective, um, 
should be okay in in their own language right okay so but in uh, i cannot imagine any first grader coming intuitively by the concept of energy Correct. so but we are okay with any concept coming in from the first grade right? yeah uh, of course and then then maybe abstract concepts of science like energy and all can force and energy can well, can yeah. be introduced yeah ashwin do you still stand by your statement or do you want to change i may i i'm seema sure, i'm sure. joining late yeah but i know what what discussion is going on yeah. my question is maybe not pertaining to this chapter alone but hmm. i would pose a question here that do we have to teach them something like energy at grade 1 level yeah i should be that's also a valid point to think about that uh, why is it so important to tell a first grader what energy is right why not just look at what let them is. learn about food let them la- learn about what what is their experience related to energy yeah more than just drilling something which the adult mind is thinking is right today right. so uh, uh, yeah i will just uh, read out what fenman had an issue with this uh, and then we can move on to something else so um, so fenman says now energy is a very subtle concept it is very very difficult to get right what i mean by that is that it is not easy to understand energy well enough to use it right so that you can deduce something correctly using the energy idea it is beyond the first grade it would be equally well to say that god makes it move or spirit makes it move or movability makes it move in fact equally well to say energy makes it stop so look at it this way that's only definition of energy it should be reversed we might say what when something can move that it has energy in it but not what what makes it move is energy this is a very subtle difference is the same with uh, energy okay this is some bag uh, other reference so uh, the answer is that you wound up the spring it tries to unwind and pushes the gear around what a good way to begin a science course take apart the toy see how it works see the cleverness of the gears see the ratchets learn something about the toy toy the way the toy is put together ingenuity of the people devising the ratchets and other things that's good the question is fine the answer is a little unfortunate so uh yeah the idea was that uh, which is something which all of you said right energy is an abstract concept and i, I also like the small twist twist that he gave right why not just break open the toy and see what is inside so toys is something which is close to every child's heart we can uh, look behind and see how it works so in yeah. fact that's what the children do and that's how they learn. so we are trying to impose something very unnatural yeah yeah but uh, you know normally children are told not to break open their toys right parents would generally not be happy if children break open their toys so here we can like specifically get a toy to break it open so i know tarun i think uh, when he was a, a baby or now he does it to uh, his son he always gets two pairs of toys and one is to break it open and one is to play right tarun very good <laughs> yeah i think that is the idea That's so very we good. can open it up okay. and see what will happen because we don't want to break a toy which is very close to us so if we have two copies then at least we can break one yeah so yeah i think uh, all of you shared great ideas so uh, the key is uh, you know and uh, he later says that you know the problem is not with energy it has to be introduced at some point all these definitions concepts have to be introduced at some point but why start it as i mean why start with definitions and i think that's true for not just first grade but for all our science chapters they start with definitions so uh, can we do something to rework the way we you know uh, share anything right so um yeah so a question to all of you uh, just an activity say you were curriculum designers and we had to design the first chapter of first graders what would it be any ideas from anyone 
So maybe some activities to get him familiar with his own body and it's working. Uh, like? Uh, like maybe uh, uh, how far you can take your hand in front and how far can you take it uh, behind and uh, yeah. can, can you straighten your arm in the front but can you straighten it at the back? So, yeah. Uh, so maybe to bring in his experience the limitations and uh, and the powers uh, of the body. Right. Yeah, I think that's a nice activity that how far can, and also it might differ from, you know, person to person. So that might also be a great uh, place to discuss. Yeah, so, so you discover what your body can do and what it cannot do and then how you can enhance uh, that uh, yeah that particular movement yeah. i just uh, have an idea i don't know whether it's relevant to first grade or not uh, actually uh, hands and legs are of same size in human body so uh, we will ask uh, we can ask them to measure their uh, each other's hands and legs and uh, let them discover uh, that uh, they are in proportion equal proportion right yeah, that would be are, they, are they in equal proportion, hands and legs? Yes, uh, hands and legs are, are of the same uh, uh, length. I also didn't know that. <laughs> okay. okay. We I, can turn it into and the, that, uh, the I mean, uh, the, uh, my uh, uh, main thought was, uh, actually, if hands and legs are the main proportion, this proportion concept comes in drawing, main. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so drawing stick figures or something. Yes, yes. Yeah, you're right. So, so if they don't know how to measure in class one, we could give them, uh, let's say, threads or uh, ah, yes. ropes yes. or wool pieces and they can measure and cut and put on a, uh, on a chart board so that they can compare the lengths. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Just threads. Yeah. I think that's also great. I think Megha had also written something I missed. Huh? Observation of things around us, how similar and different they are. So any specific example, Megha? Things, I mean, basically for a first grader, whatever they observe in, in the their world. <laughs> yeah, right. They can but list down. I mean, let every, every child have a different uh, listing down of objects. Yeah. Let every ch child have uh, share some more examples that maybe some other children have not. And yeah. then uh, maybe look at uh, what, uh, how are they similar? Are they similar? Are they not similar? Are they different? If they are different, then why are they different? How, how are, not why, but how are they different? Right. It would be a wonderful And uh, I have another idea. Uh, let them uh, uh, play, in, uh, let them play in the garden or nature and uh, let them note down uh, uh, whatever i mean uh, let them take pictures children are aware of uh, technology so let mm. let us give them uh, cell phones and let them take pictures uh, for example uh, uh, let us uh, ask them to ta um, take a picture of a plant they take in different angles they have different perspectives also right each child has no uh, no same idea so right. uh, uh, we can ask uh, why did you take from this angle or what do you think about uh, this picture? Right. Yeah, I think these are all great ideas. I just wanted to add one point. So just sharing from, based on the experiences, we generally give um, activity like observations and taking an object. Uh, parents will typically tell, you know, uh, four lines about serials and, uh, you know, make them uh, ratify it and come and share it in the class. So, there are, of course, these are all very great ideas, but implementing, so we have to think from many levels. First, also communicate these ideas to parents uh, and tell them that why this is a, a better way than some other way and so on. So, yeah, there could be some other challenges uh, on the way. But, yeah, anybody has experiences of trying this and communicating ideas to parents? Uh, just curious to know. Uh, um... I am uh, I'm pursuing beard special education. Parallelly, uh, before lockdown, uh, I have taught uh, two children, twin girls with uh, spe uh, special needs. So okay. uh, I, uh, instead of teaching them, I learned from them, their mother actually. 
she said, uh, uh, why should we think in this way? Uh, I mean, um, she said that uh, she, uh, I mean, uh, she totally changed my way of thinking. Yeah. She's a very, uh, and uh, for example, I'll I can give, give you a simple example. Uh, because uh, they are children with special needs, they don't know the money concept. Uh, I asked her, why don't we introduce them the money concept? Then she said, okay, that's a good idea. Uh, but uh, she said, why don't we give them a credit card? Credit card, debit card. Yeah. I said, uh, but we sh they should know the coin uh, currency. Uh, I, and then she said, uh, why do they have to know about the currency? The future is all, uh, everything about uh, plastic money. So uh, I was amazed. Right. So uh, uh, such, uh, such uh, parents are very few, very few. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, so yeah, these things have to be communicated, I guess. Um, Right. So when it comes to Feynman, uh, it was very interesting uh, that, you know, he he never said that, uh, you know, this is how you should teach. Uh, I really liked uh, some of the things that he says. Um, of course, he was very witty and um, very charming and uh, all these things. Uh, he, he was, of course, uh, quite arrogant as well. Um, and so uh, one of the things he says that, you know, I can't tell you how to teach science because that's your job. I mean, he was telling to teachers and teacher educators, but I can tell you how I learned science. Uh, and I think that uh, the way he was brought up by his father for people who have already read about that would know that uh, there was a very interesting way in, uh, in the way his father and his parents brought him up. Uh, and that has really stayed with him uh, till the end, I think. The, so this early age is, uh, in fact, again, it comes up again and again in his writings that, you know, universities are pointless. You can't really change people uh, at that point. You can give them additional training. But if you want to inculcate values like, you know, curiosity and all these things, it has to happen in the early age. And uh, that happened for him because of his father. And uh, that's why the point of parent came because how different parents can, you know, then he was no scientist. He was in fact uh, working in some cloth factory or something, but he had a real love and understanding of science, I think, um, which is very evident from a very small ideas that he tried with Feynman. So I'm going to read uh, next excerpt. Uh, so again, it's from the walk of, um, walk of woods. So uh, he, uh, they used to go for long walks in jungles um, in Catskill. Jewish families have this tradition of going to Catskill in summers. And uh, again, they go for walks and treks and so on. And uh, one of his friends, Fenman's friends uh, asks him, so you see that bird and bird watching is a thing. So you know, children generally go with their fathers for bird watching. So um, the other child asks uh, Fenman, you see that bird? Do you know what kind of bird is that? Uh, and I said, I haven't the slightest idea what kind of bird it is. He says it's a brown-throated thrush or something. Your father doesn't tell you anything, but it was the opposite. My father had taught me. Looking at the bird, he says, do you know what that bird is? It's a brown-throated thrush, but in Portuguese, it's something. In Italian, it's something. He says in Chinese, it's something. In Japanese, it's something and so on. Now he says, you know, in all the languages, you want to know what the name of that bird is. And when you're finished with all that, you will know absolutely nothing what, about whatever about the bird. You only know about humans in different places and what they call the bird. Now he says, let's look at the bird. And yeah, so uh, basically here he uh, learned, uh, so early on learned the idea of, you know, uh, knowing the name of something or knowing the term of something and actually knowing something. And uh, so the story goes uh, like this. So, uh, they keep on, there's a bird which uh, keeps, uh, you know, uh, unfurling its feather once it sits down. and father and son observes that. So father asks Fenman, why do you think it is doing that? So he says that he takes flight and comes back and sits. And when the bird sits back, the feathers would have uh, gone, gone all disturbed because of the flight. And that's why he just straightens them out, right? 
So he says, okay, that's a great hypothesis. So uh, then let's look at the bird for longer and then see if it's true or not. So they keep observing the bird for about three, four days. And then Fenman realizes that uh, the bird keeps doing it, not just after the flight, but even before the flight. And, you know, even when the bird is not going to fly anywhere and so on. Then they come up with some other possibility, other hypothesis that, you know, maybe it's some fleas that are biting it and so on. Then again, follows it up by clo looking it closer and uh, realizes that it tries to remove some tiny insects and so on. So again, the power of not telling the answer, but letting the child discover for himself, uh, Fenman for himself, um, and letting him, you know, go through that process of uh, experiencing that hypothesis were wrong, then coming up with another hypothesis and on. So uh, I, I, this is one of my favorite stories from Feynman. Uh, so, and I'm sure everyone would uh, relate uh, with it. So any thoughts? Ma'am, uh, this is Vishnu here. Yes, um, Hi, uh, I just want to say that uh, I've got uh, no relation to Feynman and I have not read much of his work and all, but this is what I've been doing uh, since the past 12 years. You know, I've been just taking people out and I've, I'm generally never start with the naming ceremony of the bird or anything. First, I'll ask them to check out how it flies. Why do you, why do you think it flies like that? What's the size? What's the, you know, why the wings are like this? So, you know, things like that. So uh, most of my activities are nature-based. And uh, that is how I've been putting it out. And with uh, uh, with respect to what you said with, um, let's say, uh, younger children, mm. perhaps, uh, yeah. it, uh, it's, I allow the play to happen, right? Nice. Just let them go, let them explore, let them come back with the questions. Nice. Then we discuss on that. Right. And so there is no thing of me instructing mm the kids to do something or the other. There is yeah. no restriction there. Let them go. And even if it's a, like a, a plant, like a lantana, hmm. I'll, I'll be monitoring, of course, but let them touch it. Once they start feeling itchy, they know, everybody knows that they're not going to touch the plant ever again. Okay. Fine. So that is another experiment. So that is uh, how I would generally, you know, put, put uh, learning across. Great story, Vishnu. So, yeah. Uh, any other uh, teachers would like to add to what Vishnu said? Or, um, Rinal, can I go? This is Shilpa here. I'm sure Shilpa also has great experiences. Yes. Uh, thank you for that experience, Vishnu. Um, <clears throat> with uh, 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 with Rinal's concept of not uh, giving a name to a thing but experiencing it, uh, I don't know if it, this exactly fits the context, but when you do not give them a preamble, it opens up a whole lot of other possibilities uh, for them to explore and in truth, for us to understand things in a much different way. <clears throat> uh, my uh, son, who was probably around seven or so, picked up this book called Alchemist because that's always on my bedside uh, table because that's my favorite book. So the thing that most of us know about the book Alchemist is that uh, it's a boy who chases his dreams and how the universe, you know, kind of puts everything together so he can go follow his dreams. So I did not say anything about the book to my son. I let him read it. I really didn't think uh, it's a very deep book for, for a seven-year-old to even understand anything much about it. So at the end of the reading, I asked him, do you even remember what happened? What did you understand from the book? So um, he said there's one concept in the book that keeps revolving over and over again about the universe. But then also there is this boy who's entrapped in his dream. And that is all he wants to do. So it gave a completely different perspective of the book for what it is popular in the world about. Uh, he has, of course, a seven-year-old has no clue about the alchemist. So uh, that gave me a new perspective about how, uh, you know, an untaught mind can think about things so differently. So that's with my experience. Thank you. Yeah. So Vishnu and Shilpa, great stories. Uh, but a question for everyone is, so this is all fine. I, Vishnu, I'm uh, uh, imagining that you are uh, doing this outside the school curriculum, right? Uh, this can be linked with the school curriculum as well. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, so, uh, but necessarily not like come part of school curriculum, right? No, I'm uh, linking it with the school curriculum, okay. but it, it it could go as an independent thing by itself. Yes, of course. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, Shilpa is a parent, so and uh, her son Adrit, I happen to know, so she's homeschooling him. Uh, but a question for other teachers, especially high school teachers. Um, so you know you can't get away without talking about names and terms. So how do you go about this? Any ideas? Has anyone thought about it already and tried some other way? Actually, uh, I haven't, uh, as I said earlier, I'm a beard special education teacher. Uh, during part of my uh, ed, uh, course, uh, I have to give uh, 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 practicals. So while giving practicals, um, um, my, both my professor and my uh, fellows, uh, uh, my classmates said, uh, while uh, I'm going from uh, uh, I, I was uh, trying to uh, get the answer from the students, but uh, not revealing the uh, answer uh, first. And uh, uh, for example, uh, not uh, revealing the uh, 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 title of the uh, title of the lesson uh, first. And uh, first, I give the, uh, I work on the previous knowledge of the students. So, uh, but they said no, we should not do like that. First, we should. Uh, uh, tell the uh, title of the uh, lesson and then we should go uh, so it's it's way it's tough but it is slowly uh, we should uh, change that perspective uh, regular uh, cu curriculum right yeah this is also one of the ideas that even we try that not telling what we are going to learn and then tell it in the end so yeah we don't know if it works or not we think it works so yeah we'd like to hear other experiences because all these sounds uh, like nice romantic ideas, but uh, what about actually implementing some of these things in classrooms, right? Any math teacher here? Uh, Ash, Ash, Ashun and uh, may yes. I May I share one experience? I mean, uh, I, I teach math. Okay. Um, and I teach math uh, at the junior high and middle. Okay. So uh, this year, uh, our school forced us to start the year with one month of any uh, any uh, uh, teaching but not from the textbook so we our children did not get the textbook for the first month yeah, yeah i heard yeah it was a forced uh, uh, this so we had to come up with ways on how will the uh, different subjects be taught without even opening the textbooks right nice so we thought about uh, building on uh, the concepts that had been covered last year in grade eight, I'm talking about grade eight now, mm. uh, on uh, something uh, on, on data handling, right? Mm. So we have, uh, we had, uh, and, and our theme for the month was food. I mean, we had decided among facilitators. Mm. So we had to come up with something related to food. And uh, what we came up with is why don't we do some data collection activities, come up with a, a hypothesis. Hypothesis means that, you know, what what do you think would have happened to the food habits of people uh, during the pandemic, before the pandemic, after the pandemic, so on and so forth, right? So then our whole class designed questions, broke up into groups. This is whole activity, uh, first thinking about what do we want to know? And this is what we believe would have happened. So they came up with their own sets of theories or whatever hypothesis you may say, came up with the questions. We then, of course, ratified them and all that. And then, uh, then we gave everybody the responsibility of collecting data about those questions once we ratified them from five families each. So it was not too much, it was doable. And then, uh, of course, we broke it up into different, uh, our, our data was also broken up into different uh, food uh, categories like, you know, dairy and meat and uh, whatever, like grains and all, all that, vegetables. And uh, then this whole process happened. They collected the data, they analyzed the data. Uh, they they looked at what averages and all that would need to be done. And then they realized that, hey, my hypothesis, our group's hypothesis did not come true. Our hypothesis was correct and so on and so forth, right? At least for the hundred odd families that this class collected. Mm. So this entire thing was through experience without us talking a lot about which 
which averages to take in which because every group was different every group was had a different uh, average or a different uh, y was mean more important in and mode more important in their case vis a vis some other group which graph was more relevant and so on and so forth so everything came up in a very uh, organic way nice yeah i think great story uh, great story from all of you i'm sure like vishnu said even what he have been doing or what uh, shilpa tried can also be connected to curriculum so these are small steps i guess of course eventually there is this larger curriculum that we have to cover but at least when we are trying to introduce the topic uh, in the beginning of the year or in the beginning of the chapter these are small steps that we could take take i think uh, which would have great impact yeah can i just add one thing uh, i i just uh, uh, well uh, mega ma'am was speaking i just uh, remember that uh, while uh, speaking uh, or um, so called teaching uh, you know higher grades uh, one thing i understood was um, uh, especially I, i was teaching biology and uh, they had issues with because it's all a lot of scientific words and you know those kind of things so um, what i did was the first exercise i did was to give them a set of words that would be commonly used in biology and ask them to break it down mm. and uh, the only sentence i told them is 50% of biology is language the other mm. 50% actually science so mm. whatever you're doing is basically you're talking about, you're looking into language the rest of the science comes easy and when they broke down the words uh, you know uh, that they were like oh okay they, they themselves realized that so uh, one word will either give a function or a location or something of that sort and then they started categorizing it themselves and the rest of the chapter was a like it went smooth flow you know so i didn't have to actually teach them teach them they also didn't have to rack their brains and uh, by the end of it uh, of course with a little bit of okay let's get to the garden and check out why this happens why that happens and things like that so Yes. with the combination of that then it it actually worked out uh, to everybody's advantage yes. and then they were not bored at all from you know biology they were like okay this is the first time i'm actually feeling biology interested but a couple of years too late because they were already in the 11th grade yeah 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 again so like going out and asking questions and etymology where the word comes from what why did someone think of naming osmosis osmosis right so yeah these are uh, great uh tools i think which all of us can use thank you for sharing um yeah so uh when it comes to high school science right so uh why the problem that we are facing currently is happening uh is possibly because there is this overflow of information we have known so much now that and all this increase in information has like been brought in textbooks school textbooks and then uh, as teachers the challenge is to make sure that students learn that content so um payment has a very nice thought for this so let me just share and read it out so he says that yes knowledge kept increasing and uh, you know uh, so basically uh, earlier what was happening was uh, people would just die off in the knowledge that they learned or accumulated would die off with them but slowly we learned uh, at least in humans that you know this knowledge can be transferred from one generation to the other and it can be accumulated as knowledge of the species and what happened was uh, with knowledge uh, it was also passing on some uh, biases prejudices belief systems and things were not really true but thought to be true and all the other things also were passed on right and so uh with this boom came a big disease of uh, you know just accepting the information as it is right so uh, what i have highlighted is uh then a way of avoiding the disease was discovered the disease as in the disease of just believing uh what has been passed on revering the information that we have got from our elders and so on uh this um, so then a way of avoiding the disease was discovered this is to doubt that what is being passed on passed from the past is in fact true and to try to find out ab initio again from experience what the situation is rather than trusting the experience of the past in the form in which it is passed down and that is what science is the result of the discovery that it is worthwhile rechecking by a new direct experience and not necessarily trusting the uh, race uh, experience from the past i see it that way that is my best definition so 
this was uh, about um, what is science. This is a popular essay. I encourage all of you to read it. Uh, I have read it so many times, but every time I read it, I get, get something new from it. And uh, so, yeah, so this uh, doubt and uncertainty is something which Feynman talks about again and again. So what are your thoughts about it? So not taking anything uh, on, uh, you know, just trusting because it is written in textbook or some reference book or some expert told us, uh, rechecking it wherever possible. Uh, can we do this in our classrooms? Um, and what are your thoughts on it? Maybe some others uh, who'd like to share. Uh, I can see some new people who joined, Bhuvana, Ashwini, Vinodhani. So I really like the term that has been used uh, in this essay, passing of knowledge. Uh, it is time bending because now uh, we are uh, the knowledge is not stuck to time. It is we are bending time, and the knowledge is passed on. Yeah. So, what are your thoughts about you know doubts in classrooms or questioning the teacher and uh, being in this phase of uncertainty and so on? Um, I think I'd just like to add uh, uh, to this is that I wish I was thought this way because that is the reality of today, right? We are living in an uncertain time with respect to COVID. We don't know what tomorrow is going to be. And that is how the whole evolution has been. Someone comes up with something and then someone else comes up with something. So it's always been like a continuous circle. I think acceptance of the uncertainty as a part of life can make a lot of difference. Uh, I'm not teaching right now, but I know when I get back to class, this is something that is going to be my fundamental uh, outlook towards teaching and make sure that, you know, children also get to thinking about it. Right. It's very really important. Yeah. Um, good point, Ishita. So, uh, you know, uh, what we have experienced while talking to teachers is uh, students ask a lot of questions when given an opportunity, right? Uh, and there are a lot of questions for which answers uh, teachers do not know. We do not know. And that's fair because there's so much of things uh, out there. Uh, so how do you deal with that? Teachers feel very comfortable saying, I don't know. Uh, because their point is also valid because the system uh, that has been generated, it is thought that teachers uh, is supposed to know everything. And, uh, you know, even I remember from my childhood that if a teacher would it's if it seemed like the teacher didn't know or whatever, then everyone would just lose out on the trust on her that okay, she doesn't know much. Uh, so what are your thoughts? And I think this is uh, all system generated. Uh, but how do we gay, uh, I mean, find a way out? Uh, I did come across uh, such situations uh, where uh, I was not able to, uh, when children and when students asked me, teacher, what is this? Uh, when I was not able to answer, I mean, I didn't have the pro uh, proper answer or I was doubtful about that. So I said, uh, sorry, children, uh, 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 even I have a doubt. Uh, let us explore this together. Or uh, today uh, uh, you go home and uh, research, uh, Google it. And I will also uh, research. And tomorrow we will come and discuss it in the classroom. Together we will learn. We will share our ideas. And the children were OK with it? Yes, yes. Okay. They, they were even surprised actually uh, initially they, they they thought uh, she's dumb this teacher is dumb but slowly that uh, to, towards the end of the year uh, that uh, that has changed that has changed because uh, what i think is uh, teacher is a human being she is not a supercomputer to know everything uh, and we have to uh, uh, continuously update ourselves uh, and instead of uh, updating ourselves we have to be open about uh, open about uh, what do you say? I don't know the correct word. I don't have the correct word, but we have to not knowing, right? Not knowing. Yes, that's the beauty. Okay. Yes, Mega. Yeah, and oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just uh, just adding to what she has just said. So I did come across such experiences and what I realized was that 
students actually find this interesting because what happens usually is let's say if i write a question on the board and a student is not sure about the answer they won't have enough courage to put their hands up and say the answer if they're not sure about it but yeah. let's say if there was one particular session where teacher is herself or himself mm -hmm. made a mistake and was not able to realize something then they know oh even if teacher let's just like even a teacher can sometimes not know things. So who are we? We, we are just students, right? So we yeah. are, So I always tell students to ask questions because you are a student and you are not supposed to know everything. And that is why you are a student, right? And even I don't know everything, but we are here to explore things together and we'll learn and grow together. So mm -hmm. I think that sort of relationship, once you establish between a teacher and a student, then I think even students feel comfortable at home and they'll try to experiment with their thoughts and with their imaginations. And that is what makes them a good student according to what even Feynman always discussed. Right. So, yeah. And uh, uh, I would like to add that to the previous example I have given, I always thought mm -hmm. that uh, while teaching, uh, instead of uh, directly putting the matter into their uh, minds, uh, a, a teacher and a student must co-learn. Mm -hmm. They must uh, mm -hmm. explore together. Nice. And uh, uh, learning is a lifelong process from womb to tomb. Nice. That's what uh, I I didn't say this exact phrase, but I implemented. Okay. So nice. by the end of the year, they slowly understood uh, my way of uh, thinking, and uh, it it built a rapport also. Right. Good rapport. Nice. Yeah. Another uh, disadvantage of this, uh, you know, pressure of knowing uh, all is. Uh, but two disadvantage. One is you avoid give, coming up with situations where you are uncomfortable with. Uh, so you avoid letting students think uh, openly and asking questions. Uh, other uh, disadvantage is that a uh, lot of times uh, through whatever small interaction I have had with teachers, I've noticed that teachers tend to give uh, incorrect answers. Like Not incorrect, in their mind they are correct, but if you ask them that how certain you are about this answer, they won't be certain. But while speaking like because, assumptions yeah so they assume uh, yeah no it mind they would have assumed but while saying you would say it emphatically so uh, instead of saying that maybe based on these things i think this could be the answer but we'll have to find out instead of that you just say this is the answer right this uh, the and again no blame to teachers it is just because of the system the way it is that there's so much pressure that you just can't say i don't know or you know or maybe I'm, i could be wrong so, but this is something that we have to break open, I think. Uh, slowly, it might happen, right? Yeah, uh, I think Mega wanted to say something. Or something. I think, I think similar on similar lines, uh, basically, we should come out of this uh, pressure of knowing everything. Nobody can mm -hmm. know everything. And today, I mean, again, going back 50 years or 30, 20 decades ago, when we were studying was, uh, and Richard Feynman was studying was different from what today. Today, everything, no, information is available at a click of a button. Yeah. So what I can find out in 10 minutes, maybe that child can also find out, yeah. right? <laughs> in 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we are living in a totally different age. And uh, I think uh, our approach to looking at a problem, yeah. our uh, is, is more important than to finding an answer to a, mm. to a solution. So that, that is what we as facilitators need to inculcate among uh, children. Great point. Yeah. One other teacher once told me that, you know, she thinks, uh, she lets students see how she thinks. So uh, she, like, she thinks it openly that, okay, based on this, uh, maybe this could happen and this could happen. So she lets, she thinks it aloud instead of thinking it in her mind. So like Megha said, you let them know how you are going about it. Yeah. Yes, Ishita, you raised your hand. Oh, yeah, so I mean, I did have uh, a question, but I think uh, somewhere it's answered. It's about, you know, there are certain students who just want to know uh, if the teacher has the answer. So establishing certain, um, I don't know, it's, it's about the conversation and the rapport that you build with children around the teaching and learning of science. I think that can change it. But it's been from my past experience that, you know, they just want to know what it is. And if you don't, then they just want to like laugh around. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's something that we have to manage with how we deal with children, you know, in the classroom. Tarun, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think what Ishita is saying that keeps happening, right? So like whether the students uh, 
uh, like they also want to know whether we know the answer or not, right? So like many times uh, we also come across this and uh, we say there are two set of questions, two kind of questions basically. So one set of questions are good questions for which we know the answer, okay? And there is another set of questions which are very good questions and for which we also don't know the answer, right? So many times the students will ask question and they will say, sir, ma'am, is it a good question or very good question? Because they also want to know whether they know the answer or not. And then it becomes very comfortable situation because they think that, okay, fine. They may also not know, so we can figure out together. So that conversation is happening here and I'm very happy that so many ideas are coming up. So thanks everyone for sharing. Yeah, um, I agree. Right. But uh, I can see people are leaving. So I wanted to convey one, uh, uh, you know, one idea and then we can keep discussing openly. Right. So uh, one of the things that you would notice about Payman's uh, lectures is that uh, his uh, talks or his articles are extremely infectious. Like anyone who doesn't know about science would also fall in love with that topic. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not physics physicist by training. Uh, my topic, I mean, my subject is biology. But uh, if I read anything uh, from Feynman, I get so interested in it. Uh, and I think that has something to do with the way he has learned those topics, right? So, again, it goes back to how we are learning those topics, right? And uh, I, I was thinking about what could he have done differently. And then he writes uh, about it somewhere that, you know, one idea that he uses is, uh, to explain something without using a technical term. So uh, again, my current favorite is gravity. So uh, what happens if this, I leave this? If I leave this, what will happen? It falls fall down. down. It falls down. Why does it fall down? Because it is heavy. Okay, so lighter objects won't fall down. Yes, lighter objects also fall down, but uh, uh, since it is heavy, it uh, falls down more uh, with too, uh, very much force. But it falls down, lighter also yes. falls, falls down. Yes, yes. Lighter also falls down. Yes. So but it takes time. time. It's also because you are like throwing it down. I mean, you are. I'm not doing anything, I'm just leaving it. Uh, also, leaving. maybe because lack of support. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, you got that task, right? You have to not use the word gravity, right? So. Yes. Yeah, let's see what happens. Let's see how how far can we go, <laughs> right? And really think about it. Like it's it's really not so easy. Uh, um, I I face a problem here. I I'll tell you. You know, nowadays children have become so smart. At least there'll be five children in the class who will use the term, even if you as a facilitator don't want to use it. Exactly. So Absolutely. this is a very good way to get away from those children. You know, either because of your tuition classes or uh, we, there is this illusion of knowing. You know the name of it, but don't really know it. I'm sure none of us understands gravity, even if like Tarun is PhD here from similar field. But I, it's it's a very complicated, uh, how much ever deeper that why we can keep asking more and more, more and more. Why is it falling? Uh, we can keep going on deeper and deeper. And we'll still not, we'll still reach a why we, where we don't have the answer. So I think this is a very good way to get away from uh, students' uh, bias of knowing something. Uh, so these days, as you said, no, even until fourth class, if you look at the textbooks, terms like density, terms like gravity, all these things have been introduced, right? All these things are such heavy concepts to deal with, but they have been told about them. And that's why they think they know them, which is not their mistake. It's the way the information has been presented to them. So, uh, to let them just think about uh, it in a very, you know, nuanced way or an unbiased way. We can just tell them that you have to not use the technical term, right? So let's see, let's take two minutes and see how far we can go. Maybe Tarun, you can take this, facilitate this because I am not really an expert. But... I'm also not an expert, but I can do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so I was just thinking that maybe we can see there's a lack of support, right? Because if let's say there was a table, mm -hmm. then it would, I mean, it would still fall down, but maybe not all the way through the ground or something like that. But then again, there's a question, why does it even fall down to the table in the first place? Mm -hmm. So we are back to square one. <laughs> that way. Using the word gravity, can we say there is a force Within Earth, that is pulling the object. <laughs> you don't have to use the word gravity, but yeah. In other way, if you can explain. 
So now I'm just thinking, what if instead of answering the question, I pose another question, right? Why, mm-hmm. why doesn't it go up? Why, why, why does it just go down, right? So wow, wow, what a question! Yeah, I think that's also a great idea. Again, something that Feynman's father does is uh, once they are we've gone in for a walk, and um, he notices that uh, the ball in the cart moves backward when the cart is moved forward, right? So. Uh, he asks his father, "Why is this happening?" So he could have said inertia and all, but he doesn't say inertia. He just adds more observation. He says that no one really knows why it happens, but even this happens. So you just add another observation, and then, of course, eventually, I think through some conversation, he says that people have been calling it inertia. So he also names what the word means, but still, that uh, thinking aspect has not gone. So uh, yeah, I I. think that a lot of things that feynman actually applied in life came from the way his father brought him up right yes two minutes we can try about gravity so uh, asking another question that why it is not going up is one idea adding another observation like feather also falls down or leaf also falls down is another possibility any other ways that we can go about it and what can be very that can be another idea like so will it fall everywhere down so like we can change the place also that may be another thing yeah, but the plane doesn't I'm... fall down uh, that yeah that doesn't fall down doesn't fall down so i think maybe that's because the plane itself is moving right it's not still okay so, so moving things don't fall down because we haven't seen a still bird in sky also right Yeah, I mean, ah, uh, that is what I have. Uh, so, why I I the ball I, falls I down, the ball is moving. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, the nice. thing is, nice. um, I think so. Uh, for, first of all, a disclaimer: I'm not a science student. The last time I studied science was in tenth grade. So, <laughs> yeah, but I'm 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 just, just trying to see. Listen to do this because you're not biased. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what i think is there's a difference between a plane moving and a ball moving so when i drop hold of a ball from my hand it starts from a rest position right and the plane itself is not in the rest position i mean that is one of the reasons why moon does not fall down right it stays up there still <laughs> so because it itself is moving so i don't know right Yeah, yeah. Maybe like I think uh, great ideas. Uh, again, we can think about it. Uh, maybe there's a WhatsApp group. We can continue this discussion there. Uh, but I think this is a uh, very nice experience. You can take any topic in science, at least in science, because it has a lot of technical terms. And think for yourself: Can we explain it to at least ourselves without using the technical term? And it will be a great exercise. I think I'm sure everyone will enjoy. so yeah with that uh, let's move on to one um, another point so yeah so what i was saying that this uh, feynman convinces conveys this beauty and wonder of science beautifully and there's another video of him explaining about atoms uh, it's on youtube i was planning to share it now but in the interest of time i won't i'll just share it uh, share the link on the chat um and then people can watch it later the way he describes atom you will fall in love with it like it's it's there's so much of energy and so much of uh, wonder and excitement when he talks about atom uh, and there's no jargon at all so yeah this is something that maybe we can think about as teachers as well so yeah. uh, can i can i uh, just uh, something i remembered can i just add yeah. so uh, when i was in corporate uh, we used to go and take interviews to hmm. colleges right engineering colleges and all hmm. so uh, one of uh, one of my um, peers he always used to ask this can you explain your project to your grandmother <laughs> right something that you know uh, they used to like add a lot of jargons they used to explain that project in like most uh, f- fantastic way but yeah. then okay now if you have to explain it to your grandmother who doesn't understand technology at all will you be able to explain it right so that, that just reminds me of like you know can, can you explain it in the simplest terms yeah in fact it reminds me of Yeah, my probably. phd so even during my phd we used to have this uh, grandmother's pitch so you have to explain as if you are explaining to to your grandmother and 
uh, in fact, I did explain it to my grandmother and she was like, so what? Why are you doing this? <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> so it really makes you think it has a lot of value because right. I think, okay, really, by having all this. Because uh, we, we may sometimes use technical, it may be easier to use technical language and jargon to, uh, to explain it to others, but to simplify it is more difficult than we imagine. Right. Yeah. So I think there is another thing. Yeah. Kashmir. No, sorry. sorry. Uh, I was just saying there is another thing which is relevant to this. Like, uh, which, like, I think there are books that can you explain it to your dog? I don't understand why do they say that because, like, oh. are they talking about different language altogether? So that part I don't know. But, uh, I think that's just a catchy name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct. Also, I think more than explaining, I think here also we are trying to, like, Explaining to ourselves, that is definitely, yes, in a simplified way, that is great. But here, we are not explaining to the others, right? We are allowing them to figure things out. So there is slight variation there. Uh, so how can we bring that component where they also don't use the these heavy jargons and we also don't use the heavy jargons and try to figure out things? So I think that is very important. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I just would, wanted to share one experience. So. It, 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 I mean, it, one summer I was just trying to learn crochet. I'm much more into mathematics than science. And I realized that, oh, parallel lines may not really, you know, not intersect every single time. And the only way you can figure it out is by learning crochet, because then you can create something in hyperbolic space where parallel lines do intersect each other. And that's when I approached my grandmother because I couldn't really figure out it from YouTube videos how to crochet. And my grandmother already knows all of this stuff. And she was just surprised. She says she did not like math. She says she hates math. But then here she was doing crochet, knowing much more about mathematics, maybe in that respect than me, who also happened to have a degree in math. So I think some somewhere um, with their experiences, sometimes the kind of connections that you can always make in nature and in the science, and it always comes from the nature. So maybe in origami, let's say, the way things are being folded. So let's say a uh, woman of the house knows how to fold napkins on the table in a flamingo shape, then they might know a bit about the architecture and the geometry as well. So I yeah. think it's often that we will be surprised when we talk to them and we get to know, oh, there might be another angle to the same thing. And that is where I guess inspiration also comes from. So... Yeah, just think, uh, a coincidence that you mentioned this because it's also part of Feynman's stories that uh, he's, he's written a lot about knitting um, and its use in mathematics. Uh, so uh, he is overhearing a conversation between two women uh, about something. It seems to him like some complex analytical geometry. And in those days, there were like uh, very serious sexist uh, understandings. And he's surprised that two women are talking about analytical geometry. And he just looks back and realizes that they are talking about knitting. And um, so then he says that, you know, it's not about gender or any other thing. You just have to pose the problem or uh, bring in the context where this person is most comfortable with. So yeah, uh, right. So this is a image uh, that I've, you can see an uh, image put on the screen. Uh, what do you think is this? I mean, sort of seems like a rocket or something that's about to fly, but maybe will not fly because of <laughs> what it's made up of. <laughs> right, a question. So it looks like an aeroplane. Uh, do you think it was it will fly was my next question. Kashmira says it won't. Uh, any others, uh, anybody else who thinks that it will or it won't, any other thoughts? Actually, it looks like a very good, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, camping site kind of a thing, you know, like instead of a tent, you have this there, you can just go sleep there, walk <laughs> around and just come back. Yeah. Right. Uh, maybe if a strong wind blows, it might fly. I mean, fly <laughs> off. <laughs> oh, it would shatter, it would all shatter, yeah. I guess, to the pieces. Yeah. It also depends how do we define will it fly or not. The fly word itself, we have to define it. Right. Yeah. No, I'm talking it in the context of aeroplanes. So like aeroplanes, will this one fly? Right. So as most of you pointed out, it won't. Right. Uh, can you guess uh, who makes this? So uh, this is a tribe called as Cargo Cult. Uh, and so basically uh, during World War II, uh, 
uh, lot of American airplanes flew in this in Pacific area, these new um, so they are called in one of the islands. Um, a lot of passive, uh, lot of air, American airplanes would uh, come and go uh, that they could see. And in fact, I think they also uh, uh, built some bases there on those islands. And these people who had never seen airplanes were really surprised, right? And once the war was over, uh, they started building these kind of structures. And the belief is that you know if you uh, build such structures and they actually pray these structures. So these are like temples for them. And the belief is that if you pray to these structures, technology, it will turn to a real technology, right? So, <laughs> so it's called a cargo cult. And in terms of science, it's called a cargo cult science. Uh, and how can we get away with it? So do you see a correlation with this to our science classrooms? So basically what we do is, uh, especially again in high school, right? We give uh, procedures and aim and experiments and people just follow them, right? So what they did was they looked at the structure and they created another one without really understanding how that structure works, right? And now they are just revering that structure, hoping that one day it will turn to a real, real structure. I don't know how true it is now. I mean, this is these are really old pictures. Uh, I have not done enough research to tell you more about the community, but there are many articles written about. What is it called? You said, Minar? Cargo Kite Science. If you can just mention it on the chat. I'll share the link also of the article. So, uh, are you people part of the teachers' corner WhatsApp group? No, I'm not. Okay, Please, then. Yes. WhatsApp okay. group, right? Yeah, what's up? I'll, I'll share the link here. Yeah, you can. Yeah, so we keep sharing links there, and today's links also I'll share there. So that will be good, right? So uh, how can we get away from you know building a cargo cult science, right? Where students are just building things, not really understanding how they work, but uh, you no know, copying things. So um, yeah, ideas, thoughts. So copying for form, procedures, experiments, results. Uh, and is that really science? And how do we get away from it? I think I think the culprit might be the exams and the way they are being presented. Because I, I remember when I was in my 10th grade trying to learn a subject that I couldn't, I would just see, oh, what is going to fetch me more marks? Just do that, and that is enough. So maybe if we try to change the way the exams are there and um, because that's the motivation. If 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 not the motivation, that's gonna be there forever. But that's the primary motivation for students. Yeah. So I think when then once they get interested, then exams may not matter much. Mm -hmm. But for them to be even interested in the first place, mm -hmm. I think mm, that plays a role. The way we ask questions in exams. Yeah. Yeah, that's one way. Definitely, I totally feel you. Others. Uh, Ma'am, one observation that uh, you know I I have is that uh, something like um, let's say something like chemistry uh, has a lot of uh, industrial processes underlying it, hmm. but uh, most of the time none of the science actually talk about how it is applicable in your life. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Right. So if that part is taken care of, yeah. I I think the industrial process would would be taken care of much later on automatically. True. Um, yeah. And now industries themselves are changing, but still we stick on to the same processes. And, right. uh, yeah. In fact, this is what is called being future ready, right? Like you are, you are learning the terms and concepts, but these concepts might change tomorrow. So you have to learn how to learn those concepts. And I think Geetanjali or someone talked about learning how to learn and so on. So, yeah. Also, uh, just one more thing. Also, uh, see, the thing is that uh, this these terminologies, these words, all these things, uh, these definitions, no, uh, are uh, very, I mean, I don't know, I've seen that uh, type of describing that uh, in, in the, um, what we could say, the Western culture. But if we bring it down to like the way Indians understand it, we cannot give them th just that. There's to be some something before, after, around it, where it they can actually relate to so many things. Uh, because, uh, why I'm saying is because uh, see I've uh, you know uh, did this little experiment of teaching 
uh, science to middle students rural background from bihar and i had to teach them in hindi now most of these words are falling very heavy on them and second thing is the moment uh, you know it was the the whole thing of defining something was given to them they could just not understand it there was like what only this what happens to the rest of it what about this what about that so even though the questions came in but without using those words like you said without using those words when i generally associated with different subjects different areas of their life then they were like oh that's all it says why does he have to give such a big sentence <laughs> don't ask me i didn't i'm not the one who invented that so so you know that thing came up so uh, it also uh, you know the teaching or and the learning also is very uh, location specific or well. yeah. so again it boils down to exams right if the teacher is okay to Correct. just uh, reading out like understanding what the child is trying to say and not really uh, right definition then yeah. yes that, therefore the assessments obviously have to change yeah. in that sense yeah. yeah so they'll change whenever they'll change but we can do something uh, in the meantime uh, maybe like uh, at least the formative assessments or the unit test what are called maybe few questions can be such that you know we don't really focus on definitions and something else and that might itself change the way children are looking at learning so yeah um, any other ideas i used to have this teacher who would say uh, things like you're a second hand human being that's okay. because all the ideas that you have are not first hand they are not, all not your experiences they have just a generation i think most of the ideas have already been found out and and have been transferred to you in such a way that you do not even want to explore or yeah. find out or wonder or be curious about so um, that that was a concept that really got all the children in the class thinking and wondering you know i mean as soon as you say a second hand person it kind of <laughs> affects your emotions in so many ways <laughs> because you are you know a unique person and everything but then when you actually think of it and then it's always necessary to debate on this you know how much of it is your first hand experience all that you do in your life so i mean just intriguing them in some ways so that they are you know motivated to question things is one thing that can be instilled i think nice uh, i would like to add it uh, um, add my point uh, Uh, how are we going to change the way we do this uh, i mean uh, there there is an education system i mean a method of teaching uh, uh, like um, um, montessori way of teaching i don't i forgot its uh, name i mean they uh, in that uh, method way of teaching children they themselves write uh, the, their own books they don't read any books oh Uh, i forgot its name i'll uh, let you i'll uh, i'll let you know in the chat whatsapp chat and what uh, happened to those books they they themselves uh, they explore the nature okay it's uh, they explore the nature and uh, yeah, for example uh, they read do others read them or they it's for themselves they themselves read it there uh, they each uh, child's point of view is different and they draw and uh, they write their own uh, lessons and uh, and mostly uh, it is exploration self exploration it is based on sounds very interesting if you can share the link somewhere maybe it might be useful to everyone yes i just forgot the method of teaching it is like montessori you, you recall you can share it to us and we can put it on the group sure sure definitely yeah thank you it is all it is famous all over the world uh, the the yeah. method of teaching yeah. those but, but it is yeah. quite expensive and oh. they use natural uh, products beeswax crayons i think you uh, you could oh wild of yes talking wild of yes yes wild of wild of yeah uh, i have a different way of teaching right Uh, i had a question um, i mean more a thought so uh, while i i do agree that there is a lot of merit in exploration and in uh, doing science rather than learning science uh, but there is a 10 year period i mean 10 to 15 year period in school and the amount of knowledge that humans have today 
uh, is like is too vast and um, uh, even if we explore some concepts almost impossible to explore every concept like if you take atoms or like many things we, we it might not really be possible to do experience it first hand then it completely uh, the po whole point of schooling is then you might just this will spend uh, your lifetime exploring every concept right uh, so i was just thinking i think how I, we would balance your point yeah i i uh, agree with you there uh, that there is so much knowledge now that we cannot end up rediscovering everything and then the point will be lost if you are just rediscovering everything then what so uh, the idea is not like uh, rediscovering everything and when it comes to topics like atom um, atoms or anything complex where we cannot see anything directly by eyes um is can we at least look at the experimental data or how scientists went about finding it and then look through the original experiments rather than just uh, you know uh, taking the conclusion of those experiments as facts so can inculcating this value of doubting or uh, thinking rationally and so on and as you said there's so much out there that we anyway cannot cover everything right i'll wait for others to i'll also hear from others but i just wanted to make a point uh, that uh, you know th there's so much to know that will anyway not be able to cover everything so i think one of the things that nep talks about is reducing the curriculum significantly so let's just take a small content to begin with and then less content to begin with and then explore it slowly uh, in a nice leisurely manner and all these specifics will anyway will have to encounter when children uh, you know choose a field of interest and they can go in whatever depth they want once they have uh, developed that curiosity and liking for that subject that freedom they can have but why introduce everything to everyone right yeah yeah and then yeah i get like even in biology so i come from microbiology and nothing is there which i can just see and tell children like okay look there is a microbe but uh, but can can we at least see how you know people came about finding microbes or what were the kind of inventions that took place in kind of, in terms of microscopes that make made this discovery possible or then of course look at some things around us take a pond water and something and then see if we can find out some similarities between them and so on so yes of course uh, we won't be able to do everything by first hand experience but at least look at others first hand experience experiment data and so on um, you know uh, i would like to add a point yes. uh, as you said uh, that uh, we we can uh, for example uh, we can uh, uh, how, how by uh, microscopes were found Uh, what technology was uh, uh, involved in that like that this is all uh, there math is involved physics is involved science is involved so the plight of our main education system is uh, uh, they separated the uh, subjects but they are all uh, uh, interlinked they are all interlinked they have just separated the subjects and uh, they are uh, telling the uh, students to mug up instead of that Uh, the Feynman or uh, uh, whoever, Jiddu Krishna Murthy, whoever they thought uh, they thought these are all interlinked. Yeah. In our kitchen also, uh, the, while we are the preparing dosa or uh, idli, uh, th there is kitchen science involved. Yeah, yeah, I agree. In real world, there is nothing like physics, chemistry, and biology. Everything yes. is there. So yeah, there is art also involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. so once we break that uh, uh, notion uh, then we can uh, make uh, changes i mean right. the change automatically happens right so coming back to lavanya's point and then uh, this about uh, you know how to take care of so much knowledge uh, and connecting it to uh, experiments and procedures and copying the procedures and so on uh, again there could be simple twist where you know let them do the experiment and let them come up with whatever conclusions that they want to come up with and then think about them rather than telling them okay this is the aim of experiment the aim of experiment to find out measure the surface tension or whatever something and then uh, tell them also the protocol and then you already know everything basically so you just have to put in the numbers so there are many small shifts that we can do and change this um, to to whatever level is comfortable for us right 
So um, yeah, I think I'll just give this. Um, right. So it's one key thing that Feynman is trying to define is that uh, according to him, what is science? Science is doubting. So freedom to think, freedom to doubt, and freedom to think rationally. So if we can convey this small uh, line that to everyone, that if we are learning science, we are learning to doubt. We are learning the capacity to doubt something rationally and finding it out, right? So that's the key of everything that we discussed, I think. And then being comfortable in people doubting your, you also and uh, people uh, being, being uh, comfortable in that uncertainty of not knowing things also, right? So uh, just one thing, uh, the session was named Pleasure of Finding Things Out. And when Feynman was asked, uh, what is the value of Nobel Prize to you? And he says that it has no value to me. The real prize is the prize is the pleasure of finding things out when he found things out and the kick of discovery that uh, the pr discovery gives you. So yeah, this is something that maybe we can all take back with us and see if we can let this kick of discovery let our students also experience this kick of discovery there with us, right? Yeah, so formally, I think we have way beyond time, but formally, I think uh, uh, I will end it. Of course, we are all here. Uh, for people who are getting late, you can leave, but others, we can continue discussing. I just wanted to share um, the right answer uh, for the first puzzle, Ashwin has sent it to me on WhatsApp. I'm just going to put it. So he says that uh, this is the right answer. You can all think about how to get to that answer. Um, for people who weren't there, Tarun, can you tell what was the question? Are you talking about the majestic one? Yeah. Okay, I have to go, I think. Huh. Okay, okay. So uh, the uh, question is uh, 8046 are, uh, is the number. Uh, imagine it to be written with matchstick and you have to change the position of four matchsticks such that you get a bigger number. And the biggest number that you can get from is this. Okay. Is this. So you can all try how to get it. Yeah. a seven digit number. Yeah, we can continue discussing. I think Gitanjali had some points to make. Sorry, I had to cut all of you at some point or the other. Maybe we can all share one thing that we are all taking away from this discussion. We can unmute and share or put it in the chat box. I think for me, the biggest takeaway was science is doubting uh, and thinking about uh, how can I bring it in my daily life and also with the children that we work with and teachers and so on. Coincidentally, the same thing for me, Mina. <laughs> Not coincidentally. <laughs> Ashwini says it was informative. Thank you, Ashwini. Maybe you can share one information that you like the most. Vishnu, Gita, Anjali, would you like to share? One thing I have taken from this uh, is uh, whenever uh, I see a child, whenever I'm going to give to him, give him anything, I'll give him two set of toys. One to dismantle it and explore it. One to play with. Nice, nice. Uh, I, I just realized that uh, <laughs> me and Fein, Feynman was not, were not very different <laughs> <laughs> when we were growing up <laughs> and even now. 
Oh, even so, growing up, that's very good to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because in my house, uh, you know, I used to like jump into the garden, figure things out, uh, come back inside, open all the, uh, you know, everything, and then put them back. And that that used to happen. So my parents would never say anything. They're like, okay, do it as long as you make sure that it is functioning at the end of it. You fine, go ahead. <laughs> so it has that's to a, function at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, because I, I used to open up the uh, radio and the CD player and everything, so that they said they put it back. However, but it it should be playing the song the next time I use it or anybody uses it. So okay, figure things out. I think there's uh, this article by Fenman about how to fix a radio by yourself. So you may relate to it then. Yeah. <laughs> So done that, and now I'm I'm putting that across to children. But um, it's it's like it's more like I'm purposely connecting it to the academics. It can go as a separate thing. I'm purposely connecting because otherwise people don't get that tangible thing. You know, yeah. it's like saying energy. <laughs> like yeah. how we started off, it's like that. So I connected there. I show them how the subjects are interrelated and how it's the concepts have been applied in nature. Mm-hmm. So that's that's how I I put it out. There's something we also try to do that not like talk about these things in some abstract manner but right there in your textbook there are things that we can learn so. yeah manunal uh, uh, if you don't mind can you share those feynman's fi- uh, uh, articles i'll so share the whatsapp is that okay yeah um i think one thing uh, there's so many things that i've learned but the best one was the good question and the very good question <laughs> i think that saves uh, us from you know that dilemma of not knowing nice. that finding out yeah yeah okay so that's all for today it was really nice chatting every, with everyone uh, nice to hear from everyone many different ideas so yeah we'll meet again next week uh, next month the idea is to discuss krishnamurthy's idea next month oh uh yeah we'll uh, get back with more details okay thank you very much murinal thank you for the lovely I, thank you thank you so much thanks tarun for the invite welcome <laughs> I, I almost missed it <laughs> but yeah, i just finally got through it <laughs> thank you thank you so much thanks a lot